Welcome back to the Q&A. This is part two. Let's continue to go down with the list here. Uh, the last one was about rigging. So the next one is by, and as always, by the way, I'm reading out the questions here just in case you're only listening to this. And this is by J Big C. As always, the names will be butchered uh, and I apologize as always. I'd like to know your opinion. How much do coronavirus damage the CG industry? I'm planning to move to other company, but I'm not sure if I can find a new job in my country, Thailand. Things not change much, but I'm afraid that some companies may already have financial damage. Sorry for bad English. Don't be sorry, you're learning another or you're speaking another language. That is always a tricky thing, trust me. Now, how much has the virus damaged the CG industry? Um, to be honest, I don't know. I think it has superficially, again, I'm not privy to all kinds of you know internal information. And if I would have them, I would obviously not tell them here. But I think the live action industry is gonna be more impacted than the CG industry. So if you're asking how much is gonna damage the CG industry, the CG industry might potentially even flourish, maybe because maybe they can transition some franchises into a CG version of it, or whatever they thought was gonna be live action, they might just do it all CG. This could be now an animated feature. Uh, maybe they should consider doing uh, remakes of live action movies as animated features. I don't know, I think, there might be, because you can't be on set, it's gonna be very difficult to have multiple people on sets. It's dangerous and you know, it's tricky with the virus and the security and, and just being clean and safe. Uh, if you can work from home and do a movie from home, I think that might be the better way. But then it's always tricky with, uh, you know, get the sound design, you got to the music, the scoring. So it's tricky, but I think it definitely has an impact, but less of an impact than the live action territory. That's my probably uneducated guess. Uh, art, no, no, uh, not art styley, at styley, at styley. How do you go about animating shots without reference? Some productions don't accommodate the time to shoot reference and explore ideas. It would be great to know your process for this. Thanks, great channel. Thank you so much. How do you go about animating without reference? That's a great question. It comes up, I think every time. And it's important to note that as much as I stress the fact that you have to have reference or at least act it out for yourself so you understand how it feels and the position and everything. You always learn more from seeing reference, body mechanics, some intricacies, some details, especially when you go more towards the live action or more realistic feel and look of CG. But you have to absolutely be able to not animate with reference. Sometimes you have shots, as it says here, what do you do when you don't have it? You might have a type of shots or a type of shot that doesn't have a reference counterpart where just, this is something weird, <laughs> never seen this before, it's a complicated action, you can't act it out and no one has ever done this before. So either you just make it up and you just rely on your experience and other things you've animated that you can then all put together into one shot. And that's, I think, a skill to have. And it's really important that you're able to do something really cool without any reference. You just have it in your head, you might do some thumbnails and then you can still animate ahead and it's still gonna look cool. If you have a shot where, you know, sometimes it might be fantastical in, in nature, maybe a creature animation or something, and you don't have, you know, the exact reference because that creature does not exist. My answer is always try to find something that is somewhat similar. So you can root your animation in something real so that the audience can make somewhat of a connection. Because if it's completely alien in all aspects, like the, the look, the how it moves and how it sounds, it could be a hard, thing for the audience to connect with because like there's nothing familiar. I don't know what this is, but if you have any type of creature and then you're like, you know, big orc and then it kind of starts moving like a, like a gorilla, you go like, oh, that's interesting. I kind of know this. Or you have some weird alien creature that's supposed to be cute and it starts sniffing around like a dog. You go, oh yeah, my dog does that. Oh, I, I get this and blah, 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 blah. So I think anything where you can find something that will somehow help where it's, you know, somewhat similar, that could be something. And again, if you don't have any reference, Thumbnails, you, know, you might explore poses or actions through that medium. Uh, and then sometimes you just have to make it up and then rely on your past experience and other reference you found and uh, for something that's not related, but then kind of piece it together, Avenger style and make your awesome animation that way. Adekunle Odutayo. Adekunle Odutayo, maybe. Can you explain a bit on the line of action rule, please? How does a person follow the form to see the curves when studying an animation? How can it be applied to your sequence and when you're drawing from a reference you acted out? 
And finally, does it apply to only the main poses or the breakdown as well? As with everything, you know, we have the principles of animation and you have quote unquote rules and everything can be changed and tweaked so that it works for your shot. So I'm always kind of hesitant saying, oh, that's the rule, you got to do this. But line of action definitely is important, at least to me, where it helps you simplify in a way and clarify the pose. If you have something where, look at my screen here, oh, I'm like, oh, I like totally bent and it's all, it's just all ugly posing and it's just you don't you don't understand and the twist and the, it's, it's not a clear a clear line that to me just models the animation and makes it kind of hard to look at but if you have something where let me put my phone down here if you have a pose where I should probably kind of go further back if you have a pose where you know your character would be standing maybe i can i can put in a pose in there that has that nice line but something where you go oh and you look up and you know, i'm breaking frame here but it, it goes from your leg through your body up into the head and maybe even through the arm holding whatever you're holding. It just makes for a nice appealing line that also is a, a clean indication of what the energy of the shot is. If you're hunched over, if you're attacking, it's just, it just makes it all cleaner and clear to the audience. The audience might not get this. They might even be okay with the crappy pose that's all bent and everything. But it just all adds up where you have a nice silhouette, be it like a body silhouette or, or even like a, a color silhouette. A nice line of action, just clear posing, the time, all that adds to a nicely composed and constructed and a, a clear shot that the audience will understand. Anything that's kind of obstructed with the view or a bad pose, it will just add a layer of potential confusion and then that doesn't help the storytelling and so on and so on. So anything that where you can help with a clean presentation of the storytelling pose, that's gonna help your shot. And the line of action is gonna give you just that clean line of that's the energy of something dynamic or something that's a bit more reserved, whatever you have. And I'll, I'll there's a very classic uh, screenshot, screenshot, a drawing with all the line of actions. I'll blend that in as I'm talking now, I'll put that over there. And you can't always go from the foot all the way up to the arm. Maybe there's a weapon or a flag or something that has that nice clean line, but at least try to go from the torso in somewhat into the legs, but also the head. Sometimes you have a nice body pose, a nice line of action, and then the head is all crooked, kind of breaks it. I would still find the, the, the like a line, like a stroke when you draw it, like through, that's the line, that's the action, that's the, the nice feeling that you get out of that pose. And how can it be applied to your sequence when you're drawing from reference, you act it out? I mean, also depends how you act it out, but I think anything that you do, and I'm assuming this, mostly all those topics are for cartoony stuff, you really want to simplify and caricature and stylize the thing. So even in your reference, you might have a pose that you like or something you acted out, but it still might be too complicated or too complex in terms of the silhouette and the line. Just look at what's the essence of that and then you can draw your line of action and go, that is the essence, that's what I want the energy to be and the pose feel to be. So everything that you have always comes down to, okay, that's cool, but what's the essence? How can I stylize this and what's the action and how can I caricature that to make it cartoony? Because you don't want to just replicate real life, unless again, you're going to you know, VFX and more realistic animation. And does it apply to only the main poses or the breakdowns? For me, the main poses for sure. The breakdowns as well. Sometimes you have messy breakdowns and it kind of helps you when you have motion blur that you can't really see what's going on and whatever you pose. But it, depending on the action, I still go frame by frame and try to have something as clean as possible. Where it's almost like, imagine you're hiding the character and you just have that line and it gives you that wavy, maybe it's a flag-like thing or just something where if you just have to tell the story, the energy through a line, through that line of action, is it clean and does it, you know, does it go from nice changes and post changes or is it sometimes poppy and crooked? And I think if, you, if you're able to keep that as simple as you can, to me at least, this is only going to help you with the clarity of the shot. Loop polygon. Oh, that's a long one. Let me read it here. One. I think your animation buffet is awesome. Well, thank you very much. I also really like your re-reviews. <laughs> thank you so much. Now, is there any chance you'll also show some Blender rigs? I would love to, and I've, getting, I'm, I've been getting more and more questions about Blender. It's just all a matter of time. I think I wrote that somewhere in a comment where I would love to learn Blender. I would love to learn Unreal. I would love to learn a ton of things. But right now, it's very tricky, and especially right now, it's very tricky because I have a lot of classes that came up this semester, and it's usually you don't quite know which class gets approved or not. So kind of say yes to most of it and then you'll see what happens. And for some reason this semester, everything got approved. So I have five classes. I got two animation mentor classes starting actually next week and uh, three academy classes right now. So I'll have five classes going on at the same time, plus my workshops, plus my day job. 
plus the YouTube channel and obviously all of that underneath my family uh, interactions and, and all the things I want to do with my family. So time is a bit tricky right now. So to go in there and then spend the time on learning something that will take time because it's new. I don't know Blender at all, even though there are great tutorials out there. Um, I would love to do it. That's the, that's, that was my long answer. The short answer, I would love to do it. It's just a matter of time where I can find, because I don't want to go into Blender and go through a rig and not know where to find things. It's going to take me so much longer to record. It's not going to look like I know what I'm talking about. I don't know if it's going to be beneficial at all. So I'm, I'm hesitant to start that right now, having no knowledge there. I love animating. That's the second question here. I love animating, but I still need to learn a lot. We all do, don't we? I find trouble in thinking of something to animate. I oftentimes pick a challenge from such websites as Animation Island or your Spongella blog, but I always seem to get hang up, to get hung up on finding creative actions for the character and often my creative process stops there. I end up dropping the animation. Totally get that. Do you have any tips on how to improve my creativity when it comes to scene setup and giving the character a purpose of doing something? That's a great question, uh, question especially the, the purpose. The first half, I would say, now I'm gonna plug my acting analysis and tips for animators again, I think just like last time, is that's why I do the, that series. And just yesterday I watched, I think, Hold the Dark or Hold On to the Dark, I should know the title. Uh, and again, I watched it, took a couple notes, and there's great ideas that came out of watching that movie. And I think for me, the scene set up, the scene starting, or something that I wanna construct, me analyzing those movies and TV shows has helped a ton. And like I said last time, you might, because you have so many things that you saw, you might come up with something that's going to be a mixture of multiple things. And it's not going to be a direct ripoff because it is based on multiple things. Um, but at least it's a good starting point and it's something that's going to help you get somewhere. And then through feedback, you might get somewhere else that's going to be much more original. But for me, that's the A side. I will recommend that selfishly, but that's why I do that series so that it's a springboard for ideas. And the second part here is um, giving the character a purpose of doing something. That's interesting because that's that to me is ideal where your character has like a want and like an action. There's a desire to go somewhere, either through something they want or something you have to go physically A to B. And I think I would always look at, like for me, when I, when I think of ideas, this is usually when I have student work and I try to come up with ideas to help them is who is the character? So maybe you gotta bring up a little bit of a backstory of who that character is. And and I like having, as you all know, if you watch my channel, I like sets and props. I put them in an environment and that gives me also more ideas. Oh, would it be cool to do this with that? Would it be cool to do that because of this, wherever the character is? All of that gives me more ideas. And then you can look at, okay, maybe there is a conflict. Maybe there's a problem. And by just coming up with a random problem, again, it leads to other ideas. And through all of that, to me, at least, I end up with, oh, that would be cool if the character wanted to do this. In order to get there, this, this, and this happens because of the outside environment or because of the conflict. And that's kind of how I construct my ideas or uh, hopefully they're helpful for the students if I do anything you know, at work or at home. Um, so that's the process. So uh, acting analysis and tips for animators as a springboard. And then just any type of backstory for the character and then anything that you put the character in might be helpful uh, to, to crystallize out the idea of what does the character want. But I don't have a immediate quick answer to that because that's always the tricky thing, right? In a shot, how do you come up with a great idea? What is something that the character wants to do? But you can't discount also personal experiences. Like what is something that you wanted to do that didn't happen? Can you take a simple idea to something that happened to you today, yesterday, last week, last year, and then take that and stylize it and caricature that moment. It can also just be an action that you did, something you did in the morning, like a basic routine. Take that idea, I'm gonna brush my teeth, right? That's my idea. But now I'm gonna add a conflict, something happens, or let's say something that sometimes happens to me and I should do it right now, uh, I shave and I have electric you know, razor type of thing. And what if halfway through the battery dies and then you end up with one half has a beard and the other half is clean? That could be, so the action is I'm doing something daily or somewhat daily, I, I shave here, not here. And then you add a problem, oh, I add a conflict. Well, maybe the battery dies and there's no other tool, so now the character ends up with half the beard. And how does the character use that or get out of that problem in, a, in, an, in an interesting way? And now you have all of that based out of a daily action that you do. So that's kind of how I would uh, look at. Anything you can find through watching other things, or look at yourself and your experiences, or ask other people, hey, what did you do? What happened to you? Something that was weird or funny. 
And then you take that and then go through all the steps, stylization, caricature, and, and, and expanding on things. So I think it's other people's experiences, your own experiences, and reference that you can find. Hope that's helpful. The third question here is, to practice, I like to watch references, study them, and animate them. Any suggestion for good, interesting sources? I personally follow some athletes and stuntmen on Twitter. Yeah, there's a guy just recently, uh, he said, just use anything that I have for animation purposes. Just go through my Twitter. It's, I'm sure it's also in my animation minute. Um, but that that is definitely a good idea. Um, athlete, stuntman, and any suggestions uh, suggestion for good, interesting sources? <clears throat> <clears throat> Acting analysis and tips from animators on oh, my channel. I would plug that. You're doing some awesome work on here. Thank you so much. I'm happy to see that your audience is growing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge. Thank you for your knowledge sharing. I can't even read. Uh, but you're very welcome. And thank you for watching my stuff and taking the time. All right. Ever6. That's the username. Hey JD, quick question. Did your movie get delayed as well today? Star Wars stuff. I'm not sure what that works. I can't talk about anything about any schedules. I can't answer that. I know you're on Space Jam, so maybe not as for me. Yep, 2022, but it's job security for me. Although I still don't trust companies and I make sure to continue learning new things. It's an interesting sentence. Um, you can't just trust everything. <laughs> I mean, the companies are just reacting to whatever's going on. It's not like they have a master plan that says delay everything and lay everybody off because they don't make any business then either and they will also close. It's not really, that doesn't quite how it works. Anyway, still on the clock. I'll come back to this video later. I'm watching your Spider-Verse rig. Cool, cool, cool. And my mentor doesn't think it's a good rig and says looks rushed. You know, maybe your mentor uh, has more information there about the rig and better rigging and modeling knowledge, obviously than me, but I have zero knowledge. So maybe it is, I don't know. It seems like a lot of people like that rig and did some awesome stuff with it. I'll send him your review. He only saw Sir Wade and how to install M-Gear stuff in Maya. Yeah, then maybe you should continue exploring it. And maybe it doesn't work for him. That's totally fine too. Oh, we just realized this video is less than two minutes. Just watched it. Okay. I'm not sure there were any, any questions in there, but I wanted to go through it and address it. Acknowledge that uh, you wrote this here. Carlos Osiguera. Osiguera? Okay, Guerra. Names, sorry. Hi, Gene. It's not Gene, by the way. It's either Jean Denis or JD. Hi, Gene. I was wondering, what is your opinion on social media as a way to distribute ideas and animations and as a way to promote yourself or oneself? Do you have any advice on how to approach this? Is it worth it to pursue an internet presence as an independent animator? Thanks. Uh, that's a good question, especially as an independent animator. My current answer to that is yes, it's worth it. Again, subjectively, I feel like you have to have your whatever blog website It's easy to do something for free nowadays where you have easy access to your contact information, your resume, cover letter, and your reel. Embed it as a video, put it on Vimeo. I think those are all easy steps. I would definitely recommend having LinkedIn because that's where all everybody is. And I see a ton of really great stuff on there and it's your professional network and you can forge connections and can see who's hiring and who's looking and who's available. So I'll definitely have that, your own thing and LinkedIn. And to me, I see so much awesome stuff on Instagram and uh, Twitter. I'm not on TikTok. I'm sure there's awesome stuff out there as well, actually. I think Cartoon Brew highlights a lot of uh, the best animation related content on TikTok. But I think it's there. If you have anything that's cool that you like, just post it there. If it's anything that's work in progress, you can just mark it work in progress and post it there. I see a ton of stuff and it's really cool. And it leads me to find or to look at the biography or the bio of the, of the, of the animator. Oh, that's cool. What's that? find the website or something else with a big portfolio and then I can see this. If it's really cool, you can forward that to HR and go, hey, this is a really cool animator with really great work. Maybe look into this person. I think it's it can only be helpful to expand your visibility to me. And as I tell my students, if I'm on Twitter, right, and I see something and I see an animation and it auto plays or I click on it to play it and it's not exactly what I'm looking for or I don't think the quality is, is quite there. The worst thing that happens is I'm continuing to scroll through my feed. That's all. I'm not going to, as I tell my students, I'm not going to find the person, email them, you suck, it's horrible, or or write down the name and tell HR, this person's horrible, never hire them. Like, I don't know, none of that happens, at least to me. I hope there's no idiot out there that does that. To me, all I, I scroll through, it's like, ah, it's not quite there yet. But it might just be, let me email myself this, this person, this artist, and maybe check in in a couple months to see how it is. And the best case scenario is this is really cool. Who's this? And again, that leads to, oh, let me contact this person or follow this person or, or uh, forward this person to HR or whoever that might be looking for animators. I think the upside is better than the downside when it comes to just sharing your work. Um, and I say this very naively. 
the, with Twitter, it's also a, a massively negative side. You might share something and get a lot of comments that you don't want to get. Then, and, and depending on how you how you're presenting something or who you are, instead of getting encouraging comments, it might go into harassment. Again, I'm not saying Twitter is great. Twitter has a massively, as probably all of you know, dark side to it. I think if you curate the feed where you have the the whatever you follow is there as a learning tool, I think it can be great. And as an artist to promote your work, I think it can be great too. With everything, there's always a, a, a you know a pro and contra, a pro and con in terms of positive and negative. So I say yes. I think it's good there to have a presence, and uh, especially as an independent animator where you need extra tools, and those tools are free. So anything that will help you with your visibility and promote your independent work. Um, but as with everything, everything has pros and cons and, and and negatives, obviously. So you have to weigh. How is that going to work for you? Are the are the pros outweighing the cons, and then go from there? Because everything ultimately is also very subjective and individual to your situation. So I can't really I can give you my opinion, but as always, uh, you have to filter all of that and make your own choices there. Samantha Griffith, Griffith, again it's very early in the morning. It's not that early, by the way. It's 8 a.m. What can I do to get the school learning experience, but at home if I want to go to uh, the self-taught route? Are there daily exercises I should be doing? How can I give myself that school structure? It's a great question. Recently made the hard decision to quit my school. Would love some guidance on any of these topics. Thank you so much for doing videos like these. You're very welcome. This is a great question. The first time I'm getting these, I think. What can I do to get the school learning experience but at home in terms of daily exercises and the structure? I think the thing that helps with school is the deadline. I think that to me, at least to me, was always the thing that was helpful. It's because if I'm just doing something at home and I have no deadline, and that's why I like doing the YouTube stuff a lot because it's a self-imposed deadline. Like I don't have to post anything. Tech. I can just stop any day now, right? Any minute. But I like having that scheduled. I like, for instance, like the acne analysis clips to pimp that again. I like having that on Thursday. It's on a specific day because that's the deadline. I got to do this now because otherwise I will never do it. And I think if you want to learn at home, that might be a big benefit. Um, you might maybe benefit more from something like the 11 second club where you have the monthly deadline. There's the Adam challenge. Um, there are all kinds of contests out there. I mean, I do my, my contest at the school at the academy that's only at the end of each semester. It's at the end of spring, semester May-ish, and then the other one is in December. So it's not very regular, right? So you should, like the 11 second club is every month. So to me, I think, there is the 51 best animation exercise, I think is what it's called. There's definitely a long list that you can follow there. And I would just try to find a way to impose deadlines on yourself where maybe you tell someone for accountability and that person will check in with you and say, so where is it? What, what did you do? Uh, or something with a deadline like a contest and maybe worry less about, am I going to win this contest or not? But it's just there as a deadline and the pressure of, I got to deliver this because that's the date. So I think that might be my biggest piece of advice. I don't know if it's helpful, but that's what I would do. I think for me, the school structure is the deadline. And depending on where you are, like I teach an animation mentor, an animation mentor has a really good community for feedback and help. So I think it would be scheduled uh, for, for deadlines to pressure yourself to do something and deliver something. And having a community that helps you with technical problems and just feedback for ideas and critiques. I think that having that would be really, really helpful. Um, and I think that's that. I hope that's helpful. Karar Hussein. Karar Hussein, Hussein, sorry. Make video on lip sync. Okay. There's, there could be a please in there. <laughs> uh, yes, I actually have a long list and that's one I need to get back to and I always get derailed with other clips or having no time like the last couple of weeks, it's been, my schedule has been a bit sporadic. Speaking of which, where I just, I don't post. I don't have time. The school started, I had a ton to do. I'm not going to post anything this week uh, because it's my child. I can do whatever I want. But I do have lots uh, on my plate in terms of lip sync. And again, the camera, those two I need to continue. And the demo really one. I want to continue those three series. Um, the tricky thing with those two is that I don't want to just talk about it because those necessitate demos and that will take time. And I want to do them, but then there's always school, like they're paying for the semester or my workshop people. and that always has priority and I put that first before anything that's just self-serving to some degree or, you know, putting on the channel. So 
make video, I will. Thank you. Uh, the 3D fella. It's a funny username, I like it. Can you get a job with a AAA studio while only using Blender? No idea. 3D generalist versus specializing. Pros and cons, things to know when shooting reference footage, demo real advice. Ooh, good question though. Can you get a job with a AAA studio while only using Blender? I really don't know because I'm not in the AAA game studio. Uh, probably uh, Unreal, maybe Unity, probably Blender. Uh, I don't know. Again, I'm just reading, I'm saying stuff. It's just words coming out of my mouth. I don't know. I'm not. Um, I would point that question towards Harvey Newman. Uh, he has a ton of content based games, he does game stuff. So uh, he had Q and A's and he had stuff about engines. So anything game related, go to his channel, subscribe and ask him questions. 3D generals versus specializing pros and cons. I mean, it's kind of like either you specialize and you're really good at that or you are a generalist and you're good at many things, but not as good as if you had specialized in one subject. So. The pros and cons is what do you prefer? What do you want to do? Uh, and in your area, job-wise, what is better? Or do you have more jobs for specialized skills or do you have more generalists? I mean, it's the question is, do you want to learn something to get a job or do you have another job and then you want to learn that on the side? I mean, there's so many, again, like I said, so many individual uh, say categories, but ways to go about things that will be different from person to person, if that makes sense. So. You have to look at what you want and is that something in terms of a job um, and then make decisions based on that. But I think it's definitely good to know more than one thing in terms of job security. Um, but there's also something about being really specialized and knowing something really, really well that is a great asset to people who need that. So again, pros and cons, I mean, it really depends on your situation, what you want to do. <clears throat> a little pop there probably I had to stop and restart the recording the battery it stops after half an hour uh things to know when shooting reference footage um i can link in the description a couple uh, clips i did about reference i think the main thing when you shoot reference is know what the reference is for meaning that are you shooting reference to really look at your posing and your line of action as we talked about before where you really want to study what you're doing or so you can thumbnail and really take that and put that into your posing. Or are you just going for ideas? We don't really worry too much about how does it look. It's just kind of like you want to explore ideas and kind of get some details. That's another way. Um, do you just want detailed stuff, fingers, eyes, something very specific. Just know what you want to shoot. That's the main thing, not just shoot something. And if it's something for your shot that you really want to replicate, make sure that the camera and that if I'm shooting something like this, and that's my reference where, where uh, I sit, that actually focused, yeah, huh? where I just sit and talk, but your shot is a character standing, then that reference doesn't quite work now, does it? So that's the biggest thing where I see when students shoot reference is that what they actually want to animate and then what they shot for the reference doesn't quite work. Like if there's something where you need to see the feet and the legs and how that the mechanics of that work, but then it's shot only torso up, you can't see the legs, then what's the point? It doesn't quite work. Or if you do a weight assignment and you're pretending to lift weight and it's nothing heavy, then you won't have the strain actually what the shoulders will do and the elbows and everything. I think just really know what you want to shoot, replicate as much as you need to, depending on what your needs are. Uh, and even things like when you talk to someone tall, put tape somewhere and look up, like you can do that uh, and have a plan. And, and if you're really bad at that, uh, find someone, uh, like a reference buddy that you can use, that you can then direct and then you can specify what needs to be done for the shot and you can just direct the shot it might be faster and you can explore things better uh the many things but uh i will also link in the description uh the clips that i did about that demo reel advice same thing i got a long uh series which i should continue about demo reel uh as a quick answer make it not too long and best shot first um and don't do any crazy music or any sound effects that will distract from the work so it's basically your title card your name, what you want to do, character animation, whatever, so that they know what, what, it, what it is that you're looking for. Uh, I will put in the year just so that when you look at the real ego, is this from like five years ago? So 2020, whatever, when you're looking, watching this, um, and contact information and have that couple seconds. So you want to get to the work quickly, but you still want to be able to read who is this and how can I contact that person? And then the best shot first, it comes down to the best shot first and not relying on any music, just in case someone watches this without sound. And it has to be the best thing ever. And then the second shot, the second best thing ever. And if they're still watching, then make sure that everything is awesome and not 
somewhat okay but just because you like it because then it's going to bring the whole level down and then end obviously on a, on a killer shot and then a longer 10 second length card thing where you see the name and more contact information if you need to your linkedin or whatever accounts you have or links or whatever um but i think it really comes out to the best shot first imagine always someone doesn't have time to watch the whole reel so yeah 30 second reel could be okay one minute also good probably not longer um if you have shorter shots within a couple of shots you just know this person can animate so having like a two minute reel is just so long after a while so i just keep it short and just do the best thing uh and put the best thing first that'd be my, my short answer uh that username is a it's just an a is there something you disagree with and or wish to change in the animation industry um yes so many things um but again it depends also because of my situation where i'm in um you know my subjective view of things uh there are many people that will struggle more than i do or did so they're going to have a lot more to disagree with and that they want to change um man there's so much stuff there i the main thing for animation the tricky thing is with anything in terms of education is that people need to have access to that education so if you can't afford a computer to animate that's already a problem so anything where it's there's a way to provide the tools for someone can't afford them so they can learn that's already a, a, there's already a financial hurdle just to get the tools to get somewhere and then there is the educational hurdle where i think we talked about that last time where so much material is in english and i'm part of the same problem is I do everything in English even though I'm Swiss and I could say stuff street uh, en français but I'm doing everything in English all the material that I have is in English too so I'm continuing that cycle of, of, of English so that's another thing do you speak English so if not then that's already another hurdle so anything that that can be done and I say this I'm not, I'm not doing it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm, I'm adding subtitles in a different language I did subtitles for one clip and it's such a pain it's take it takes so long in an ideal world, I would have my clips in multiple languages uh, in terms of subtitles. And what I would love for YouTube to do, which they'll never watch this, no one, no one cares about this, but I would love for YouTube to have multiple audio channels. So I can record this like now, and then I can have another channel where I do a voiceover in German, another voiceover in French. And then when you watch this, you can decide not only the resolution, but then also the, the different channels, audio channels. So you have the original audio and then you got the, the voiceovers and whatever. It's like you switch subtitles. I think that would be really cool because then you can also hire other people who will then say the stuff in different languages and then it's it's accessible to a broader audience. I think that would be really cool. Um, so to me, Animation Industry is already the, the learning aspect. And this is why I do all that stuff for years on my, on my blog, which is super old by now. Or stuff like Animation Before or this channel is because I had help. I had help like my dad paid for school, right? That's already somewhere further along than other people. And then in school, I had help. The teachers were awesome. And then graduating, I emailed that, that cold call email thing of at ilm.com and at pixar.com. And just found people and emailed them and they all responded and they all helped. And this is one of the main reasons why I'm doing any of this because none of them had to help. None of them had to take the time to help me, but they did. And it sure helped me and I got a job and now I still have the same job and I'm enjoying all the stuff that I'm doing because someone took the time to help. And this is why I put a massive emphasis on teaching versus other things. Like I have a ton of video games that I still buy and I never play them. I could stop teaching and play all my games, right? But I don't want to do that because I always feel like I want to pay forward because I benefited so much from other people who took their time to help me. So I want to help and do as much as I can in a way that is accessible to people. And the, I, I am exploring courses and classes and things that are paid, just because it would also be cool just to create a course that you just only pay once for, and then you can use that, and then maybe use that in combination with my workshop maybe, but something where it's a bit more in detail, like a couple hours long, which would be super boring potentially to watch on YouTube, but something as a package you can buy. But I still wanna find a way you know, where I can do this, where it's, it's I can do this in a, in a way where I can spend the time and not neglect other things uh, and not get away the, the options how, how much I'm going to charge for this because I do want to also emphasize that it's a service and, and just like if you get a job you should be paid for that so there's that thing of well but it's educational don't you just want to put it out for free I do 
but at the same time, it's also a lot of time and effort that I put in. And then selfishly, I want also something back for that, but still in a way that's affordable for students. It's a very fine line to find pricing on things. And then always the thing of, well, why should I charge? I'm doing this on the channel. Why not put everything on the channel? Um, so I'm wrestling with all kinds of things like that, but there's something I'm, I'm working on and that might be helpful in that aspect, but also in a way, smaller things where I don't have time for Patreon to do exclusive things for people. So I'm trying to find something where people can get something or purchase things that will help me, that will help me and support the channel so I can buy things, tools, hardware, rigs, that I can then review and put on there for free so people know what it is and they can make a better decision in terms of purchasing or getting something. It's a long answer, but my, my phone turned off at that time. Um, so animation industry is such a long answer that I might probably end with that because it's such a long thing. Um, so access to people so that you have a more diverse background and a pool of talent that will bring their ideas and uh, sensitivities of timing ideas and, and, and acting choices. And there's so much like, like Rise Up Animation is such a great job of highlighting other people who might not have the, 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 the tools or the opportunities to be featured, right? And I think that is great. That's something that needs to be done. And it's not, sometimes have in the comments are people, mm, it's because it's politically correct, me, 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 me. No, like you can't, if you have something that's being worked on, let's say in animation industry, with the same group of people from the same country, the same culture, it's gonna be a certain way. Sure, and it might also be awesome. I'm not saying that's not gonna be great, but me being Swiss and French, my mom is French, my dad is Swiss, and being around a lot of foreigners. Like when I came to the academy, my roommate was American. My neighbor was from Dubai. The other guy, I can't remember where he was, but he was not, he was not American. Then the other neighbor, um, Jewish of New York, American, then his his roommate was Austrian, and then Lebanon was another guy, and then there's a French guy down the hall. I mean, it's like that that dorm situation was so cool because you had so many different people from so many different countries and cultures and ideas, and it, it was just more interesting with a, a wealth and just a difference of opinion uh, and, and just a perspective of things. And I think if you have that, that group of people that's diverse, and again, there's like people like, Diversity and stuff, it's like this catch phrase or word to throw out that people love to jump on to complain about. It's like, why? It, it can only be better. Like, I don't I don't understand that line of thinking. This goes into the whole racism thing that I just, I don't understand. I'm not, I don't, I didn't grow up like this. I didn't have that environment. Obviously it exists and it's everywhere. And I, in a weird way, you go, okay, I guess if you're raised that way and this is what you were taught, that's why you do this and that's why you behave like this to other people. But I just can't make that connection. I don't understand how you can be so ignorant. And to me, it's the same thing with adding different voices from different cultures and countries to a project. How can that not be better? I don't know, like, I, don't, I don't understand why that is a negative. And that goes for cultures and, and gender. It can only be better to have different opinions and different cultures, point of views, that will question the material to make it better because you can't just make something and it's going to be done and, it's, and that's it. If you're an artist, you notice you will go through the process of revisions and comments and changes and tweaks. And if that comes from a wider pool of opinions and, and uh, you know, points of views, it will just poke more holes that you can then fix to make the end product only better and stronger and more appealing to more people because you want to spend all that time and money to make a movie or a short or something so it's only seen by a small piece of the population like even just from a business financial point of view don't you want to have it be seen by as many people as possible to get as much back revenue so you make money so you can put that money put that into the next project and it's that's the cycle of doing your production i mean i again uh there's so many things that i don't understand why you would not want to do that why and if you do something where your project is based on a specific culture or a country or something, why wouldn't you have people on that team, on that project who are familiar with this so they can do it right and enrich that story with the right perspective? Again, it blows my mind. I just don't, I don't know how that is not the logical line of thinking of things.
I'm, I, I don't know. This is weird. And I'm sure it's gonna be some turd that watches this and clicks thumbs down. Go ahead, I don't care. It's just, I If that is your way of ignorant thinking that there shouldn't be a, a more diverse pool and you don't think that's gonna help, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, again, you're a product of an education and an, an influence of your environments that, you know, I'm not gonna say it's, there's no blame on this. You can educate yourself and still change your opinion, right? But again, I'll end this, I guess I'll end with this. It's, uh, it's turned into a longer rant, but there's so much you can change in the animation industry. Then to me, uh, transparency of um, payments and pay scale and wages and everything. Everything in America is always so, I can't tell anybody because either through contract reasons or whatever, or if I do this, someone's gonna use this to, to work you know, in their favor, it's gonna be a competition. You need to have more information so that you have a better understanding of your field so that you can negotiate better rates. Like that to me, again, seems a very logical thing to do. And I posed that question on, on Twitter in terms of how much can I see? I would love to tell you how much I make, but then there's probably a fine print somewhere in the contract where I get into trouble, but then someone said, but in California, there's it's not illegal. They can't do anything against it. Um, so yeah, I, in my classes, I tell my students how much I make, what the salary is, and, and just everything around the industry that will help them in terms of negotiation power. Um, there was this recent hashtag, what animation paid me, I think, I forgot, and I just told the students I need to research that. A couple of hashtags in terms of what the industry is doing in terms of, of the, the wages. Glassdoor.com will be a way. Um, yeah, I mean, whatever you can. It's always tricky when you ask someone how much you make, because they're not going to tell you. And again, depending on the culture, especially here in this country, they're not going to tell you. If I go back to Switzerland, it's literally a second question that I get. If I go, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? Where are you working? Okay, how much do you make? Like, what's your time, what's your position, how much you make, what do you have? Like, it's, it seems to be such a normal thing. Every time I go back to Switzerland, I get that question. And I'm not, like, I'm not offended. It's like, that's how I grew up. That's normal. Like, you want to know. It's also good. It's, I'm curious to know what other people make. It gives you a, a reference. It gives you a comparison. Um, but, you know, in this country, some people don't know, uh, like, what their parents make. How much their family is making in terms of salary. Like, what? How do you not ask? How do you not know? How is that? That can only be limiting to you and your development as an artist in terms of your negotiation power. So I don't know, it seems all strange to me. Um, what else could you change? I would love, this is super tricky because it's kind of chicken and the egg thing. Like you can't ask someone to take the risk to, to make a movie that is not your typical family fare of a CG animated movie because that makes money. CG movies are still expensive. So you gotta do something that makes money back so you can pay your artists and have profit to put that into R&D to develop more things to create a new movie. You know what I mean? You can't just make a movie and lose all the money on it. That being said, I would love for, uh, at least in the States, the for movies to address other things or just have a different audience. It doesn't have to be like super hard R or it's super violent or something, but you can have a lot of adult themes and other things. Like the classic thing to say is that well, if you can shoot it live action, then why animate it? I understand, I understand that the medium, because it's animation, you can do anything. Then why not choose a subject that you can do in live action because you can do an animation and expand on that fantasy stuff and like all kinds of things that's really cool that would be super expensive and weird and live action tricky to do. Absolutely do that in animation. At the same time, I'm also of the opinion that why can't you have an animated movie that's something like Shawshank Redemption? I mean, why not? Why not? Why can't you just tell the story, but it happens to be animated? Again, the, the argument is that because it is super expensive and you might just find a location and then with actors and it's, you can shoot this in, you know, in, in a month max um, and the whole production is going to be much cheaper and that's your story. And you can put it out there for consumption much easier. I also understand that. And again, it comes back to the money. It's a tricky thing. I would love for animation just to tell other stories that are not always the family route but then because it's so expensive, then why? Like why bother if you could shoot a live action because it's nothing fantastical and you don't need any CG creatures in or anything, right? So because it's easier to do live action and cheaper and faster, why would you do the animated? 100%, I understand, I understand. Like I'm just saying generally, I'll, I would love to one day in the future see the opportunity financially or somehow production wise where it's, where it's just as quote unquote easy, nothing is easy to make a movie and you just happen to make it animated where you just, you know, you can be home and you tell the story of something that is not your typical CG animation movie uh, and it's easy for you to do and then distribute and so on and so on. 
hope that makes sense. It's like lots of rambles and uh, and ranting here. Um, what else for the animation industry? So many things, so many things. Um, and as much as I complain or would love for things to change, uh, I do want to end it because what is this like? 18 this is going to be a longer clip again. Uh, it's still awesome. It's not like animation is full of problems. Obviously, it has problems, just like any field has problems. But it's still awesome enough. If someone says, should I do animation? The caveat is all, always depends what industry and what company you want to work for. Because it's, it's you know, everybody has always those top companies in mind, like I did when I, when I went to school and graduated. I wanted to work at specific companies. And, but you just have to be super aware that it's very hard to get in. It's very tricky. So it's just a hard thing to get into the industry, to stay in there, to stay competitive, to make it. It's all contract based. You constantly have to move. It's super hard on yourself. And if you have a family, it's even worse. You gotta take kids out of school. You gotta move from city to city, from country to country. It's a massive pain. So if someone says, do I, should I do animation? Would you recommend it? It really is also so, so subjective. I say yes, just because it's been great for me. That doesn't mean it's gonna be great for you. Chances are it's gonna be a lot harder for you. Because again, the times now are harder, especially with the pandemic. Uh, when I graduated, the, the demands on the demo reel were not as high as, as our artists have now. One of my portfolio teachers back at school, he got hired at his company uh, through a bouncing ball. You know what I mean? Like each generation has a, a, you know, different, a different looking demo reel. So to me, like bouncing ball, that's easy. But then I had to do a bit more complex stuff and acting stuff. But if you look at my demo reel, pff, it's nothing compared to what people have to do now. So all that gets harder and harder and harder. There's more competition. Um, so would you recommend doing animation? Again, yes and no. I think it's really cool. It's a great, if you get in, it's like the most spoiled job you can imagine just because of the type of work you do and you get paid for that. But there are a ton of hurdles to get there. So maybe if you're good at something else and that job is gonna be less stressful and more secure and you have a better way to support yourself or your family or your friends, then maybe that's a better thing to do. Um, again, it's very so, so subjective, and uh, I'm just rambling, rambling at the end here. So it, the, the whole problem of industry just triggers so many thoughts and things that I want to talk about. This will be hours and hours and hours. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna end it like that. Uh, animation is awesome for the people that can do it and have access to it. You mean like that's always that? Like with anything, someone say, "Oh, I love doing this." And there's always going to be someone that says, yeah, good for you, but I can't do that because I don't have access to this. I don't have that, you know, given to me or I don't have the resource to, to, to do that. So I think anything that someone enjoys, someone's not going to enjoy it. And someone that had a good time there, someone did not have a good time and someone had access to it, someone does not have access to it. So if you want to do animation, it's awesome. And consider what is your personal situation? Can you get there? And hopefully, this is very self-serving, I don't know if I even say this, but hopefully my channel and the, and the information, the material that I put out there is helpful to get there because it is free and hopefully clear enough in my ramblings that you can take the information and apply that to your education and learnings to get the job that you wanna get. So I just hope that selfishly, uh, but also altruistically for other people that what I'm putting out there is helpful because I have access to things, I have years of knowledge, and other people don't. And again, that's the reason why I'm doing this, that you, you can take this freely to make yourself more competitive and get to your goal faster and in a more educated way. Um, that's, that's the idea. That was not even a question in the q and A. I'm just, that's almost very self-serving. I'm gonna end it with this. It's a long clip as always, but Q&As are like that, free form me talking and rambling and stumbling over things. I hope it's helpful. Uh, I got a ton more questions. I'm going to continue. Uh, and like I said, I got a ton of semesters, ton of semesters, ton of classes this semester. So I hope I can do this on a weekly basis. This has not been weekly with the Q and A's, um, but I'll try. Just know that I'm extremely busy. It's not because I'm just not doing anything. I'm just busy, got to find the time. And these clips, Q and A's, they're longer. They take longer to assemble and upload and everything, but they're coming. All the questions will be answered. Uh, as always, if you have questions to those answers, Feel free to uh, comment. Someone had questions the last time, which I'm gonna take and fold into the next part of the whatever future parts that I have. Uh, and that's that. And uh, yeah, if you like this, like it. If you wanna subscribe, subscribe. You know the drill, again, very self-serving, but it helps me, it helps the channel grow, it helps with visibility. Again, it helps 
being visible in other people's recommendations, which means that it's there again for more people to use as free material for education. So as much as it's very selfish and self-serving, like and subscribe, the hope for me is that by being more visible, it's helpful to more people. That's the main idea that I have behind this channel. So yeah, like and subscribe if you want to or not, or just click it off. If you're still watching this, by the way, this is a really long clip. You're super patient. So I'll say thank you uh, and I'll see you in my next clip. Thanks.